welcome back to Buffalo Times. I'm Nancy Shade and I'm here at the Golden Mean Studio Gallery on Bunker Hill having an interview with the MAC nurses. I say nurses because there are two of them here. This is Perry Heller who started the MAC nurse and this is Andrew Kohler who has arrived when in Vermont. Uh, I moved to Vermont at the beginning of the pandemic with my now wife Mavis, uh, who's from Greensboro, and then I linked up with Perry not soon after that. And Perry, how did you decide to move to Vermont from, where did you move from? Well, I grew up in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and I had aspirations when I graduated high school to potentially live either in Massachusetts or Vermont, because I've always liked these areas. Mm -hmm. But my passion for photography, which is my first career, oh. landed me in New York City. Wonderful. And I was able to suffer an urban life for a little under 10 years, because the trade-off for the career opportunity was, at the time, worth it for me, even though I don't really prefer urban living. Mm -hmm. But I thought, I'll try the New York thing, because I want to be a photographer. And I did that. And that was great. And then I decided this isn't worth it anymore because I would like to be happier. And happy photographer does not necessarily mean happy where you're living. So I decided to start my journey and looking around the country for other places that I might be able to, you know, kind of reinvent myself and see what else I want to do in my life. And I kept coming back to Western New York, near the Finger Lakes, mm -hmm. some parts of Massachusetts in Western Mass, mm. and then Vermont. Very good. So eventually I landed in Vermont and realized that when I discovered Hardwick, that it was as close to the perfect town that I was looking for in my fantasy of small towns. It is a perfect town. <laughs> for me. Yeah. <laughs> and about 3,000 other people, but if it was truly the perfect town there would be a lot more than 3,000 people living here. So I'm glad that it's not the perfect town for most people. Yeah, we'll keep it a secret. <laughs> it is the crossroads in a way. Yeah, it's really I nice. I mean, you, it's easy to get to Montpelier and Stowe and Newport. Yeah. And St. Johnsbury. Don't you forget could, Canada. What more can you ask for? Canada, <laughs> yes, with all their trucks. And day spas. Yes, that's it. So... Um, how did you get involved with the computers? I mean, being a, a photographer, you, that means you do understand mechanisms. I had to learn and become very fluent with my Macintosh computer, which I started off with a G4 Mac Mini in, I don't know, maybe 2001 or 2002. And it was breaking all the time. So I had a very intimate relationship with its innards and also dropping it off at the Apple store in New York City for warranty repairs. Um, and then after that, I got a G5 desktop, sort of a tower that sits on the floor. Mm -hmm. And um, that also had a lot of problems, but I didn't really have time to drop it off and get it repaired. So I would oftentimes do my own repairs. And I had other more tech knowledgeable friends that helped hold my hand through a lot of those repairs that now I would consider extremely commonplace but at the time seemed excessive for me to attempt on my own, but I got really good at it. So I'd repair my own computer all the time. And um, then when I moved to Vermont in 2009, I brought that computer with me and it broke after a couple of days of use here. Oh my. And I tried repairing that one myself and that was a fail. So I ended up having to get a new laptop, which broke a lot. And I had to figure out how to fix that myself because I was no longer in New York around easy to find repair shops. So after disassembling that a million times and repairing it a million times, I just got good at fixing my own computer. And then one day I was up at the co-op in Hardwick at the Buffalo Mountain Food Co-op and a woman named Heather Davis uh, noticed me sitting there with my working laptop and she was having a problem with her laptop and she's like, oh, I heard about you, you're from New York and you're a computer guy and you know how to fix computers. And I was like, I, I don't consider myself a computer guy, but <laughs> what's your question? She's like, well, I'm having this problem, I'm having that problem. I'm like, well, what kind of computer do you have? And she says, the same exact one that you have. So I was like, oh, I'm very familiar with how to repair this particular <laughs> Mac. <laughs> so it was a very easy to come by job that I was not marketing for. But I ended up 
taking her computer in and sort of repairing it. And she was very impressed and started referring me to some of her friends. And next thing I knew, people were dropping their computers off to me for repair. That's amazing. So. Well, so how did you become the Mac nurse? Did, did Heather mm. give you that title? No, or? no, she did not. Um, I originally thought to call myself the Mac doctor. And I had put an advertisement on Craigslist in Vermont, you know, some guy in Hardwick, I'm the Mac doctor, I repair computers, whatever. Just a Craigslist ad, not, it wasn't even a registered business name, it was just me working out of my house. <laughs> and I got an email from a guy who runs a business called the Mac doctor down in southern Vermont who was a little bit upset <laughs> that I was using his trade name. Uh -oh. So I had to think of a way to pivot out of Mac Doctor, and Mac Nurse came of that. So I think that is yeah. really an incredible story. Really? Oh, thank you. Yeah, because <laughs> I mean, everybody doesn't get computers that break all the time. Mm, Mine hasn't not, broken. Not been my, my cat experience. has pulled up the little. <laughs> <laughs> not in your experience. <laughs> I only see that the broken one. <laughs> okay, that's why we're we. Want, I'm so glad to have that story because uh, people do come to you, and A lot of them, um, yes. And, and sometimes you have to give them good news that it is repairable. And All computers are repairable. They're all, com they are? They're just a bunch of parts combined. Mm -hmm. So if the computer is comprised of 10 parts, one of those 10 parts is likely causing the problem. So it's just figuring out which part needs repair and yeah. then offering an estimate of repair cost to said customer. And either they agree or don't agree with the repair cost. Mm -hmm. So it's not that it is not repairable. It is. It might not be affordably repairable, but every computer is repairable. And you tell them that from the get-go, so they don't have to be worried about not knowing what the results are going to be at the end of the whole no worries at process. All. See, that is very helpful, I think. Well, and that, I mean, it's not different than taking your chainsaw into the repair shop or your car to the auto mechanic. Well, and my husband who f repairs furnaces that are broken, he has to go through every single step with everybody. And sometimes he just does it on the phone and they can fix it themselves. Oh, well, and then generous. they don't have, he doesn't, he doesn't have to go out and they don't have to pay him, but they, but it's, it's a matter of heat or no heat. Uh, mm, that so is life or death. Often he has to go out at odd hours to be able to do the repairs. That's so true. repairing things, some people just have a really good knack for it and some people don't. And Andrew, are you part of the repair or are you more uh, of the reception and in the explanation part? That is a really good question, and the fact that you're asking right now today, well it's timed. actually very well timed. Um, so I was hired originally as the office manager, which is primarily fielding phone calls and emails and scheduling appointments and helping people out, you know, explain our process and do intakes of computers. And over the past year and a half, working close with Perry, uh, he's been sort of taking me under his wing and showing me how to do more and more repairs and I am doing more one-on-one -on -one tech support with customers as well. And as I'm starting to transition more into that role, we're actually looking for somebody to join our team and take over some more office managerial responsibilities. Oh. So right now I'm kind of wearing both hats, kind of a foot in each door as we're um, in that process and looking for the right fit for who can take on some of those responsibilities so I can move more into doing the repairs. And how do you envision that right fit to be? I mean, how, how do you find that person? That's a great question. Um, we They're are still in the throes of it. Um, <laughs> if anyone out here is watching right now, um, you can definitely find your way to our website and we're you know, still in the process of finding the right person. Um, and it's a process and fortunately we are doing it sort of on our own timeline. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to really fill, fill it with somebody who will be able to be reliable and show up and trustworthy and have the ability to multitask. And we're really not looking for anyone who has much tech knowledge or background because we can teach whoever comes into this role everything that they'll need in order to do the job well. What we're really just looking for is someone who is one willing to travel to Stowe, which I know around here it is 
hard to find the right person who is willing to do that. You know, that's, we that's do the drive true. several times a day. But uh, when I worked on the week, mountain, um, a lot of people came at six o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. showed up at the mountain to work right. on the mountain. <laughs> so, I mean, that's one reason I moved here because mm -hmm. there was real people here that were really working, working people. And yeah. they, they could, they traveled, mm -hmm. a lot of them. An engineer went all the way to Burlington every mm. day. Wow. So, yeah. So yeah, that is. It's it's there's a, there's a good working society here. Definitely. And you know I, I wish something like even in town that the um, Lyman Orton would bring his country store here. He tried to go into Stowe, but they didn't want him there. Right. So we have we have the industrial park and we have the the yellow barn and we have everything available and the Canadians would come down and shop at the country store. Mm. So but I'm. I agree that we don't want, I mean, there's only so many crossroads you can have. And you live, your shop is right down the hill from the Jude Vine Library. Mm -hmm. So it's it's walking distance for mm -hmm. a lot of people in town. But so if somebody actually lived in town, they could actually just work, walk to do the managerial um, part. But the part that is complicated to me is how fast technology changes mm -hmm. and how some people don't feel like myself really qualified to understand how all of these gadgets I call them gadgets mm -hmm. work and they seem to be reinventing things all the time like um, now we have to have a 5G and we didn't get the towers that we were looking for would that have made a difference about the 5G that now a lot of people that don't have telephones or computers that can receive um, what they're what is being sent out, um, it gets a little difficult for people to know how to use these devices to the maximum usage. And also, sometimes the different companies you can't even connect at times. So I was reading the other day that um, Jeff Bezos was sending out 3,000, um, what are they called, Kurt? Help me here. What? Transmitters. Transmitters at, to network um, in outer space. They won't be as far out as satellites, but they will be out there. And it will be a web, literally, of transmission to us receivers. <laughs> that wouldn't be literally... It would be figuratively. Figuratively, thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd actually have to have a web up there, a literal web. I see. <laughs> yes. It's not liter yes. literal. The reverse of literal. Yes. But when you see it um, in a picture, it has them placed, but it also has lines that go from one to transmitter to another to another, all the way around the Earth. And how soon will that happen? Everything seems to be happening so quickly lately mm. that it's hard for the customer to know what to do next and what type of device that they're going to need to do that. Mm. And, and the connections are getting so immediate, uh, but they're still not doing always what they're meant to do. So to buy a computer like you did and have it break and break and break every time you bought one. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a mess. That must have been a message of, this is what I need to do in my I life. Surrendered. <laughs> you surrendered. You <laughs> surrendered. Things that I buy break. Uh, but you're I'm so. Okay with that. <laughs> I would prefer it didn't happen. I would prefer it didn't happen as well. Yes. <laughs> so, um, because I wouldn't know what to do. And but I think you you really reasonably price what you do, and you're very fair with people, and you give them the time that they need. But if they don't understand how to do the work on on this device, you don't have people. You don't teach them how to use the device. It, well, we that, certainly can. You can absolutely. But do you do that as a group, as you once did, or um, do you do it individually? Great question. Uh, we are always happy to do group sessions. So let's say yourself and five of your friends get together at your home and wish to have one-on-one -on -one or group tutoring. 
the hourly rate is the same, just divided amongst five people. Oh. So that's how we do group sessions now. But we don't offer yet workshops where, we like, in the past, you might have experienced, you know, Mac nurse rents out Grace for three hours, and we present a workshop to 20 or 25 people at one given time. That was a, a fine idea, but in reality, the 25 people that showed up were all at extremely different levels, levels of understanding, and they were not friends with one another. So there's a little bit of vitriol <laughs> between attendees who are like, oh, what a dumb question. Let's move on. Yeah. Right? Or then someone asks a really complicated question that the less technical people are like, wait, I don't even understand the words of that question. So you have a mismatch of skill level and understanding and sympathy towards one another yeah. that I found that environment to be less than satisfying to instruct in. But if five friends get together and ask us to come, well, there's a little bit of sympathy amongst the group. That's very good. We're here. We're at my home. Oh, she's a little slower than him or he doesn't understand what she does and all that. Mm -hmm. There's an understanding and a patience that friends have among each other that strangers seem to sadly don't. Mm -hmm. So that's why we kind of changed that up a little bit. That sounds good. I'm glad I asked that question. Mm -hmm. I have a round table upstairs, a glass one. And eight people can sit, but five people would. I think you've chosen a good number because, uh, yeah, some people get lost in the fray if mm -hmm. you have 25. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And then there's always like the class clown and he's like asking silly questions and <laughs> everyone's mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to name anybody specifically. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's um, tell us, uh, Andrew. What is your background with computers? So most of my experience with computers comes from my experience with music. Um, so I'm a musician, as is Perry, actually. And in college, I got very into recording software and using my computer in conjunction with my keyboard and microphones to understand sort of the ins and outs of how all of that works. And then in New York City, when I was living there, I was the inventory manager of Patagonia at the Bowery location. And I was always using Excel and all of these computer programs to help manage some of those things. So I've always found at whatever job I was working and whatever passion I was pursuing, computers were kind of a, a focus of that and was always helpful in whatever task I was tasked with. Mm -hmm. um, so when I came to Vermont, I didn't ever have like a computer science experience per se, but I was always pretty comfortable with Mac environments and using Apple products. And Perry kind of took me the rest of the way as far as that training and understanding. And I find a lot of the work that we do is kind of just helping meet people wherever they're at. And a lot of our process is that sort of one-on-one -on -one tutorial. And actually every time a computer is brought into us, we have baked into our process a 30 minutes at the time of pickup where we actually sit down with them and, and load the computer, fire it up with them so that they're not surprised when they get home. And if we've done any work where the computer looks or feels a little different to them, we try to like make ourselves available. And it's really, I find, uh, satisfying to be able to offer people that experience. And I always love working with people. and making sure that what I'm passionate about, they understand as well and share some of that, you know, excitement about it. And how did you meet each other? Through a mutual acquaintance. Um, actually, the person who officiated my wedding is how I first came to know her. Uh, her name is Amy Rosenthal. And she's also known Perry just from being in the, the neighborhood. And well, I happen to be very good friends with her son, Zach. Right. Yes. And oh, good. my wife grew up with her daughter, so we had a lot of crossover. And Very she good. knew Perry was looking for someone to fill the office manager role, and that I was looking for something to do once I moved up here to Vermont. Mm -hmm. And she kind of put us together. Wonderful. Yeah. And did you did you you had these shirts made, right? Yes. Um, my mom actually made them um, <laughs> all the way in Chicago. Um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, like a lot of people, she started making masks and kept sort of leveling up her abilities. And eventually she started making custom masks and figured out how to make like these custom patches and iron them on. 
And then once I started working at Mackner's, Perry had the idea one day, wouldn't it be cool if we had some like Mackner's uniform and we got our logo on there? So I called up my mom and said, hey, I know you're doing stuff with masks. Do you want to try a shirt? <laughs> and these are um, the first batch, actually. And I think she did a pretty Is good this job. Is the first batch, the black ones? Uh, she did them all together. We sent the black and gray all oh, okay. as, as one batch, and she just went for it. And I think she did a pretty great job. Yeah, she did I a think nice she job. did, yeah. too. Real nice. Yeah, and it's the apple is at actually right in the center of the of the uh, emblem. Yeah, it's it's very well placed. Yeah, <laughs> there is a cross in every life, <laughs> and crossroads. Yeah, and it sounds like it, you cross roaded all the way into knowing each other, and it all worked out well. I'm so glad you're so. here, and Thank I you. I just um, I I hope the public when they have the need isn't shy to go in. And and yeah, we don't bite. No, you don't bite, and <laughs> he doesn't. And you don't. <laughs> <laughs> we keep them back. <laughs> I know you prefer not to. <laughs> so, anybody that has the patience to go through as many computers as you have bought okay. and had to repair, <laughs> did you actually buy them new? Uh, I've only purchased new computers up until I became Macners. <laughs> uh, then I would never buy a new computer again because I can get. A used one that's half broken at a really good rate, mm -hmm. and then I could fix it up. And then you know, like very few mechanics have brand new cars. That's right? true. You can get an old Porsche yeah. for like eight thousand dollars, and then you just put some time into it. Now you got a nice Porsche mm -hmm. that's worth forty, but you got for eight. Yeah. So yeah, it's, that's that's what, that's what my husband does. He buys these exactly. cars for nothing, and then repairs them and drives them around, and then lets them sit sometimes. Sure, sure. But you know, he, he's, uh, I understand that now. I would not have understood it before. Yeah. Um, I'm not a person that easily repairs things. Mm -hmm. I make things. Right. But I'm not, I don't, if I break something, like that frame right there needs to be put together. I've noticed it's split. Mm -hmm. So little things like that I can do. Uh, but mechanical things I don't have the knack for. Mm. And so so moving into this whole new world of even thinking about banking with our computers, mm. that's scary to me. Yeah. I mean, I like to write my checks and keep the, keep the stub so I know mm -hmm. what I'm doing. It's tangible. But <laughs> the cloud is not tangible. Can you explain the cloud a little bit to us? So, Absolutely. Um, that's a question we get all the time from customers. And <laughs> One of the best ways to explain it typically involves us drawing a picture. We're very visual and we try to use oh, a lot of good. metaphors. Yeah. But basically the cloud is just how on your computer you access a lot of things. So on your computer you have a lot of files. Um, you know what they look like. You can see them often on your computer. Sometimes they exist way out in California on like Apple's what are called servers, which is basically just a lot of boxes that have data on them and you access them through the internet. So it can be very confusing sometimes when a customer comes in not understanding their computer's relationship with various clouds. There's an Apple cloud, there's a Google cloud, there's Dropbox. There's a lot of different services that involve what they'll call the cloud and understanding how your computer has a relationship with that cloud and where the data and files actually exist is really important as a computer owner, um, especially in Vermont where we have really slow internet. Because if your computer is communicating with a cloud to try to download a photo or get a file and your internet goes out or you're just in Vermont and it's really slow, it can be really painstaking sometimes to try to navigate that with your computer if you're not quite sure what's going on. And that's really where we excel, is trying to untangle people's relationships with that cloud and really make it clear what is in fact on their computer and what is only being accessed kind of through the internet. So if we had transmitters um, that were out there, we wouldn't need cable. We would just have the transmitters in space. Hmm. And, but that's not the iCloud they would be transmitters. We'd still have to have a storage place for... Well, I'd like to answer this one. Please. 
Um, before I get into the answering that question, I would like to further <laughs> indulge the first question. Sure. To maybe make it a little bit more relatable to mm -hmm. people that grew up with landlines mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. cell phones. Mm -hmm. But essentially, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, or whenever, when you pick up that phone, you hear a dial tone. Mm -hmm. And you either go, right? Or you <laughs> beep, beep, boop, beep, boop. Right? So when you make that call, your voice actually has to go to a server. So be it, I don't know, a bell. Was Bell a company that mm -hmm. you? Yeah, right? Ma Bell. Ma Bell. Monopolized. Right. So there were a, there are a couple of bigger companies that routed phone calls. Mm -hmm. But when you're speaking and that phone call goes through, you're not actually there's not a wire between you and the recipient. There's a wire between you and a centralized location, and then from that centralized location, there's a wire to that person. A long, long time ago, you'd have an operator plugging wires. Okay, right. let's connect this person to that yes, person. Yeah. But after that obsoleted itself, they had automatic routers that instead of having a person working there doing this, it was a machine that was like, oh, Perry is calling Melissa in California. And there would be like a virtual plugging in of that. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, that centralized hub still needs to exist because you cannot physically connect yourself to someone else in the world. There has to be either one location that routes those pieces of information or multiple locations that route it as quickly as it can. Um, so essentially, modern day, the cloud is the internet. So when you send an email to somebody, so let's say you are sending an email to Joe Schmo, you, sit, you hit send and it goes to a middleman first. So if you're sending to someone's Gmail account, it goes into Google first, and then Google quickly passes it along to your recipient, Joe Schmo. It still has to go to that middle person first. That middle person is the cloud. So the cloud is the internet, but it's basically a middleman between what you're trying to communicate to or what you're trying to receive a communication from. And is that the machine that puts off a lot of heat? Oh, they definitely put off a lot of heat. So they're in places where we don't need to know where they are. Well, I'm not sure how that question is relevant to the, the amount of heat that it, it produces. Well, it would be better if it were in a cooler place. Well, typically these storage data centers, which we'll call the cloud, are football field size stadium buildings that are extremely air conditioned because when you have that quantity of stuff worrying and processing, all computer processes produce heat mm -hmm. and they work best when they're cool. They don't mm -hmm. want to overheat, right. but they are very happy being cool. So these locations, it doesn't really matter where they are in the world. It just matters. Is there ample electricity available? to cool those facilities to a good working temperature. Mm -hmm. If you want to melt down the internet, you just simply overheat any of these places and there you go. <laughs> There's all your stuff. Wow. So the internet is just like that phone router, but it's for different kinds of information, not just for phone calls, but for sharing of more complex things. Nonetheless, it still requires, instead of a phone line in your house to connect, it requires an internet connection. And that internet connection allows you to send emails or watch movies on Netflix and all that stuff. Uh, and the better your internet connection, the more complex stuff that you can send and receive. Mm -hmm. A phone call is relatively a small amount of data to pass through the world, um, but sending a photograph or watching a movie, uh, doing a FaceTime call or a Skype call or a Zoom session, those things require a bandwidth that is very great and that bandwidth is what we're currently working on improving across the world whereas phones the bandwidth that they needed was pretty much the same from 1930 or something all the way till now there's no need to improve phone systems because you're only transmitting voice and you know for about a hundred years there didn't need to be improvement Mm -hmm. Maybe at the beginning it was like, speak a little louder. And then, you know, a couple of years later they figured out, oh, if we just make the wire maybe a little thicker, it will have less loss. 
but that technology was perfect for a hundred years. But now when the internet came out, they tried to put the internet through the phone line, that existing phone line that already existed. And the amount of data that you can put through a phone line is uh, not so good. Not so good. <laughs> it's not so good. So the first iteration of the internet was dial up. Remember? Yes. So dial up was very poor. It had very slow speeds. And then they figured out how to use the phone lines using something called DSL. And that increased the ability for a phone line to transmit and receive data at a higher quality rate. But it has a maximum of what it can do. Um, so people in rural areas that already had phone lines coming into their house, it was a good intermediary step of like, okay, it's good enough. It's better than dial-up. But then as things increase and more cloud-based computing comes into play, DSL simply can't handle it. So people like us in these rural areas, we suffer with slow internet because the distance between homes and the, the density of population is quite sparse. And that's the transmission. That is the tra those cables that you want to run to get fast internet. If it costs several million or hundreds of millions of dollars to run that infrastructure, but there's only 10 houses in a town, well, you have to divide a million dollars by 10 homes, which nobody in those 10 homes is going to want to pay $100,000 for internet. And then if that becomes obsolete, and we've already taken and spent the million dollars or however many millions, um, then all of a sudden Mr. Bezos comes along with this whole other offering, and that would speed up everybody. It would speed up everybody. Mm -hmm. And how, what do you foresee happening in the future of this complex communication system of all these wonderful ideas? I foresee everything getting better as far as accessibility. Better for our health, I'm not so sure, but that's not my main concern. Is it better to just wait until, until um, it is better, or is it better to dig into the ground and put all these cables and spend uh, all this money that the government has given us? That might be outside of my general area of expertise. <laughs> so we need to look into that a little bit before the money gets spent, and then suddenly there's a better way. Well, That's, there's always going to be a better way. Yeah. Even after the better way comes around, there will then be another better way after that. So it's kind of an uphill battle. If we keep waiting too long, then we're just going to fall into obsolescence. I think it's generally good to try to keep it as up-to-date as possible. And the older people are sometimes obsolete anyway. So, <laughs> so I don't think so. Well, it, the wonderful thing about getting older is that you have memories. You've done a mm -hmm. lot of work and you've you've gotten to a certain place and everything seems to you start to see how things do meld together. But it seems that today, maybe because I'm older, that things are moving faster than what I can keep up with. And, I, mm. and it's pushing me along and I want to say, I can't go that fast, slow down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you true. guys are on, you're in the wave, you're in that quote current sort of. Not really, not for me. <laughs> no. I'm a fighter of change. I don't like this evolution. I don't like the rate of change. I'm surrendered to it mm -hmm. because I know what is necessary but I don't enjoy it at all. I'd rather just still have my landline and no cell phone. And I, I don't really love embracing the change, but it's not really what I love or don't love. And I think that's where people, and you're talking about older people, some older people are a little bit more adaptable. But the ones who love to romanticize the way things were, they end up butting their head against evolution mm -hmm. and they suffer until they surrender and they always surrender. There's always going to be a moment where they say, this is worth the trade-off. And for maybe the half of 1% who don't want to surrender, they move to Worcester or some you know backwoods town that is fighting so hard to make sure there's never going to be cell service. That's going to last for a little while until Jeff Bezos sends up satellites into space 
and now you can't block yourself from that, right? <laughs> but you can do it up to a certain point, but eventually everybody will be under this tent of technology that you cannot avoid unless maybe you build an underground bunker and, you know, you could always go to the extremes to avoid, mm -hmm. but it's a fight that I've tried fighting for most of my life and I'm not fighting it anymore, but it doesn't mean I have to like it. I love the way you say <laughs> surrender, though, because my father was an engineer, a mechanical engineer, and he used to, he had a teacher, he, he didn't make this up himself, who used to say, blessed are the peacemakers, but blessed also are the pace setters. Mm. <laughs> and so there is a pace that we're in, and be able to make the right choices, and on the timeline of that is really important right now. Um, because we don't know whether what the next step is really and if we do spend a lot of money to try to just maintain it could be that this could happen faster than what we know mm. and so to have the patience and to surrender to um, to how things are in the moment seems to be the most intelligent thing to do. I mean, this is sort of philosophical and what yeah, if kind sure, of talk, sure. but we need to be able to communicate these things. Right. So, governmentally, even, we don't make these potential errors without having a lot of knowledge behind it. So, you have contributed greatly today to my knowledge. I hope that you feel the same out there in, in this wonderful land we live in um, and come back and hear the next time that we get together. And I'd just like to ask Andrew and Perry if they have anything else they'd like to share with us as um, we depart. I'm happy to just say one more thing because it was on my mind from your last question. Um, at the rate of change and being surrendered to but not liking, I can personally attest, and I'm sure Andrew would agree with me, that whenever we get a new computer in, new from Apple, the 2021 version or the 2022, each iteration of new computers frustrates us even more because there's more technology that is either non-accessible to us as technicians or non-repairable. So just like with cars, I think a lot of mechanics are like, oh, I like the way they were built back then because they had parts that were accessible and there weren't all these computers and you know even in computers they start off as very basic and easy to repair and they're getting so complicated and they keep making the parts smaller and smaller even the screwdrivers that we have to use I used to think that what's called a T Torx like a T6 was so small I was like oh my god it's so small I could barely fit it in there they're down to T2. T2, yeah. T2, so it's like this little microscopic screwdriver, and if it's not manufactured perfectly, you strip the screw, and then it makes it very difficult to repair things that are getting harder to repair. We don't love that, but it's our job to surrender to it. So we're not designing the computers, and, and we're not building them, but we are repairing them, and we don't particularly prefer to work on more difficult computers to repair. And I don't really feel like it's my place to ask, why do they do this? Why does Apple design computers that are less repairable? I don't know. I wasn't at the table when they made these decisions. Somebody was, and it's not me. But you if someone, be. <laughs> well, someone says, you know, why is this so hard to repair? The answer is, I don't know, but we'll fix it for you, right? It's just our job. So I don't know what to say other than that. But well, oh. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, so if... You know, anyone out there has a computer or needs any assistance either with a repair or upgrade or just wants to learn how to better use it, just don't hesitate to reach out. You can always give us a call, 802-472-1727, um, yes. and you can visit our website or just stop by. Um, we're often very busy and sometimes with customers at that time, so if you just walk by um, without us expecting you, um, you know, we'll get to you as soon as we can, but we always like to preface that the best way to uh, schedule in an appointment with us is to give us a call or do it through our website so we can schedule and set aside time special for each customer that walks in. So we're available 
and our time is theirs. And we have your card, so we'll put that up on the screen so okay. you can see that um, and write it down. Great. Yeah, yeah, we do have a website, of course, but not everybody has a working computer when they're looking to reach us. Right. Which is the dilemma. <laughs> that is right? a dilemma. So that's why we have a phone number. Yes. Um, we have a website. We have email. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty easy to reach us. Uh, we pride ourselves on getting back to people if we're not able to take your call or to respond to your email. Uh, I'd say within less than a day, typically, or at yeah. most a day. But because we're trying to be a small town shop and provide that level of service that is not available at like a larger, more monopolistic store, mm -hmm. it requires a little bit more infrastructure and by appointment. And when you come to pick up your computer, we don't have you just wait in line and pull a number. It's by appointment so that we carve out that 30 minutes or 60 minutes just for you. And during those meetings, it's just Andrew and I. We don't have the ability to answer the phone and have a meeting with you. So while we're giving someone excellent customer service, we may not be able to take a call because we're just a two-person team. Mm -hmm. We'd like to be a three-person team. If we had right. three people, somebody could be fielding calls while we are meeting with customers. Well, we I look like forward that. to meeting your new person. Yeah, me too. Whoever it may be. <laughs> and I say yeah. bravo to both of you and thank, thank you, you so much thank for you. coming and doing this interview because I think it will help a lot of people to know what direction to go in, you know, not just to throw it away, but... Oh, don't throw it away. The, yeah, <laughs> don't throw it away. No, no, the, a good Mac is good for 10 to 12-ish. I mean, I can get probably 14 years out of a Mac, but only because I'm not paying someone else to repair it. But <laughs> I'd say, you know, 10 to 12 years is a pretty decent life expectancy if yeah. you maintain it. Yes. After... You know, once you're in that 12 to 12, 10 to 12 year mark mm -hmm. and a major repair is needed at that point, it's not that it's not repairable, but the cost to repair might exceed the value of the computer. So that's when it's like, it's good to have a professional assess that and give you a realistic expectation of if you put this kind of money into it, here's how many more years you're going to be able to get use out of that. Mm -hmm. And that's a helpful piece of information because the information available online is incorrect. <laughs> but then, do, do, should they come to you uh, for a second-hand computer? Yes, yes or we sell them. You, yeah, we sell them as well. And, but do you also sell new computers? We consult people with choosing the right computer for them, for their needs. I see. So it's a job that we take a lot of pride in because we help people figure out, do I need to spend 1200 or 3800 or 700 if you go into a store they're going to sell you whatever typically gives them the best commission there's a little bit of conflict of interest in a store that is trying to sell product that they already have in stock or that is going to meet their needs best mm -hmm. it's it's a difficult situation to have a store and the employees really listen to a customer and not oversell them or undersell them because they're incentivized to maximize profit. When people hire us to consult about what kind of computer should I purchase, we charge a flat rate. And regardless, if they purchase a computer for a thousand or four thousand dollars, we are not receiving any benefit from either of those purchases. We're a neutral third party and we can listen for up to an hour about what your needs are and get you the computer that's going to meet your financial needs and your long-term technical needs. And I think that's a really interesting place to be in where we don't sell brand new computers because we're not Apple authorized, but we can consult. And in fact, we could probably save on average, you know, 300 to maybe a thousand dollars as opposed to going to a store where the employee might sell you a computer that is far more computing power than you will ever need for twice the price of what you would pay if you were to just get something a little bit more reasonable. Oh, that is great news. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe we'll do this again when you have your new new. That would be uh, really partner. great. Yeah, we can bring go. that third person in. They could do their own interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, see you next time. Thank you for listening. We appreciate your attendance to our interview here. and. Good luck with it. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Thanks so much. Thank you.